good to see you today. Jed, I'll, I'll kick off by welcoming everyone to the Data Economics Festival. If you're just uh, tuning in, you can check out what else is going on this week at lydian.com slash festival. That's L-Y-D-I-O-N dot com slash festival. Uh, we've got a great lineup, 20 plus content uh, sessions on data economics, the intersection of data and economics and how this technology is uh, shaping our landscape. Um, we also have some fun happy hours. Uh, a little later tonight, we're gonna have a cocktail mixology class by uh, the CFO. So that's gonna be a lot of fun. And um, tomorrow we have a golf clinic to get you ready for summer. And we also have a live sing-along. So if your karaoke skills have gotten rusty during the pandemic, uh, we have a fantastic uh, musician, Tommy Giacconi, a, a song list there. You can pick off the list. You can sing out to the Zoom audience and uh, get yourself ready for some more socializing coming up this summer. Um, but right now in this session, uh, we are going to chat about uh, digital and data assets in the landscape and intellectual property law. This is really uh, fascinating to me. Um, Jed and I were just chatting before uh, we opened the session about um, all of these new things coming like NFTs and uh, as well as all of the uh, digital asset landscape that's been there for a couple of years. I think this is a hot topic if you are an investor, if you're a founder, if you're just interested in this space and um, trying to figure out what's going on. So I'll kick off, uh, Jed, would you like to introduce yourself to this audience? Please? I would love to, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Hello, everybody. So my name is Jed Ferdinand and I run a boutique law firm specializing in intellectual property with offices in New York, California and Connecticut. And I've been an IP lawyer for 25 years and my particular area of practice is with respect to commercializing and monetizing IP assets. I have a bunch of side ventures. In addition to my law practice, I've been a, a rep and agent um, on the kind of monetization side. I've been involved with crypto and working on some projects with the Ethereum Foundation for several years now. And I also am a law professor at Fordham University as an adjunct teaching these subjects. So. I'm very passionate about IP. Uh, I'm always happy to talk about it. So again, really happy to be here and look forward to an interesting discussion on, to me, an area that's evolving. It's evolved so much in the past few years. It's evolved so much more in the past month with NFTs. And to me, uh, you know, it's gonna be a really bright future and some interesting developments for IP going forward. Thanks so much, Jed. So I'm going to kick this off and, and ask you a question. And this actually comes out of, um, I, I was on a conversation on Clubhouse the other day, and <laughs> there happened to be a lawyer in the room. And there were some uh, kind of younger, newer founders asking questions like, okay, I came up with this like great idea. Do I copyright it? Does that mean I just like mail it in an envelope to myself? How do I protect my IP? Uh, does this IP belong to like me or to the company I'm working for? All kinds of things that I know you, you would say, hey, these are like fairly basic uh, things to understand in IP. I think they're really important to understand um, for anyone who thinks of developing uh, their own ideas into intellectual property they can commercialize. Could you talk for a couple minutes just about the very like basics of IP? W what are we talking about and what should maybe founders or, or execs keep in mind in this space? Sure, I'd love to because I represent a lot of founders and part of my kind of ongoing frustration is people have been conditioned to either not focus on IP or to de-emphasize it, maybe perhaps because there's a perceived belief that it's too expensive or too difficult to obtain. And so it's never part of the mindset of most tech founders when they're starting a company. And to me, that's a real shame because I'm in the business of you know, protecting and monetizing IP assets. And I look at it from the other side, you know, on the exit side, on the, the financing side, where the ability to have protectable IP assets is so valuable and so impactful to the financing. So yes, let's spend some time on IP 101. Let's go to the basics. There are basically four main pillars of intellectual property that'll be relevant. The first are patents, and that's under the patent laws of the United States. And I say United States because it's really important to keep in mind that all intellectual property is entirely territorial. There's virtually no worldwide grant of IP. So 
you know, the territoriality means you have to apply for, file, and register in a particular territory. And then if you want worldwide coverage, you have to go and seek protection in other countries. So a patent is for a useful article and it's for inventions basically, for functionality. And the interesting thing about a patent is you don't have patent rights until you have registered patent rights. So you'll often see people in their pitch meetings say, well, you know, we filed a provisional patent. Well, that's basically just a starter patent. You just file really anything. It could be on the back of a napkin. You just plant your flag and that gives you a year to file a full utility-based application. But, you know, one of the, I, I'm not a patent prosecutor, meaning I don't write patents, but I, I certainly monetize and value and, and buy and sell patents. Part of our ongoing frustration is the patenting process has been somewhat hostile to the digital world in the, in the last five years, not appreciating how technology has evolved. It's one of the many ways IP is kind of antiquated mm -hmm. and needs a refresh. Um, it just takes a very long time and is very difficult to obtain a patent these days. However, it doesn't mean you shouldn't be trying if there's truly something of value. The second big pillar is copyright. And most people think of copyrights as artistic works. They're works of expression. And they are novels and plays and comic books and sound recordings, um, but they also protect computers and computer software code. Hmm. So they're very relevant to our discussion as a digital asset. The good news about copyright is they actually exist immediately as soon as your work is fixed, meaning when you've written the code, when you've put the last pen to paper on your great novel, you actually own a copyright. You should then go ahead and get it registered with the copyright office. And the good news about that is it's really simple and inexpensive. It can be done online and believe it or not, it only costs $55. And the copyright office for the most part is a rubber stamp where they virtually accept most all submissions Whereas the patent office has a very involved examination process where you know, they actually end up rejecting most things. And then there's trade secrets, which are really the flip side of what we're talking about because a trade secret is a technology right that you have because it's secret. It's something that you've invented or some kind of process or some kind of data that you have but its value is derived because you're keeping it secret. And that doesn't mean that you can't license it. It doesn't mean that you can't share it with others, but it has to be in very defined ways. Like with a non-disclosure agreement, you have to take great steps to protect your trade secrets. Otherwise they lose their value. And the final kind of fourth pillar of IP are, are trademarks and brands. And those are names and symbols used to differentiate your product or service from another. And that's a whole other set of laws and guidelines. Trademarks in the United States, you don't have to register them, but most people do because there's a lot of benefits to doing that. And the trademark office is set up for a registration process that's very robust. It's 45 different classes of goods and services. And uh, the application process takes about a year or so and uh, you know, owning a federal registration, it's certainly in the monetization process gives you a leg up from a branding standpoint. So those are really the four main components of US IP law. And again, I tell all of my clients, and I represent mostly rights owners and, and, and asset owners to be thinking about how best possible to protect the assets they have because that will usually lead to better monetization and commercial opportunities as a result. No, that, that's great. So Jeb, would you say that in this kind of digital assets, data assets space, the, the crypto world, if you will, I mean, are, are, mostly what we're concerned, are we mostly concerned about patents and copyrights, would you exactly. say? Exactly, okay. exactly. Yeah, to the extent that you can, and again, while the patent laws are, are antiquated, the copyright laws are even worse. I mean, the Copyright Act was written in 1976, and you can imagine back then, 
you know, the only computers that really existed yeah. were the hardware. Nobody cared about software back then. So, you know, we've gone, what, 45 years since then. And, you know, the digital world has exploded. And can you believe mm -hmm. they haven't even rewritten the laws or refreshed them for the most part to appreciate the new digital asset world. And so you're now in a lot of ways trying to fit, you know, the square peg in a round hole for all these right. things. But, you know, the reality of our marketplace is people have these great technology assets and there's value there, whether they're registered or not. And that's the, the real trick is how do you find value? How do you maximize value? And even from an IP standpoint, you know, that can be done without the registration process, right? It's not required. If there's somebody out there who's willing to buy your technology, even though it's not patented <laughs> or copyright, obviously it has value. Yep. So, I mean, you brought up NFTs. You have, this has been a hot topic at the forefront of your mind. And it's funny, uh, just the other day, a, a friend of mine who comes from the fine art world, she's worked in a few of the big auction houses, uh, is starting to get really interested in the NFT space. We were just having a chat and she says, well, if you have the NFT, does that mean that then you have the rights to make like the prints of it? Do you own the, the copyright? Like, what do you really own when you own that? And, and she was asking all these questions because I guess with, and you would know better than me, if you own a fine art painting, if it's something that's sufficiently old enough, you might have the rights to make uh, some prints of it, um, but not if it's new. Hey, and we have another uh, panelist joining. Hi, uh, Tidar, is that how you say your name? And yes. I know you have a nickname too, so let us know what you prefer to be called. Tidar is fine. Hi, hey. Jennifer. So glad nice you were to able here. to join. Nice Hi, Jed. Um, and we have Jed Ferdinand here. So just to bring you up to speed, because I'd love to hear your, your take on this as well. So Jed gave us a great overview of kind of the, the four key areas of IP and what uh, founders and maybe investors in this digital space should be looking at and considering. And then we were getting into to talking a little bit about this new area of NFTs. And I was commenting that, that a friend of mine from the fine art world was saying, well, like, what do I actually get when I get an NFT? Do I get any of the rights with that, what should I tell my clients? Like there are people calling, asking the auction house, like, what is this? Should I be buying this stuff? Um, you know, I mean, I, I don't think anybody has the answer to that, but I would love to hear your take, Jed, and also Tedar on what, what are people getting? Are they getting any intellectual property rights when they're getting these NFTs and who, who owns the copyright here? Is it the original artist? Is it the, I don't know, the whatever platform it's on? Do we know? <laughs> so uh, I'm happy to keep going if you want, because I, as I told you offline before, for the past month, I've almost been doing nothing else except NFTs. It's really kind of in the IP world, just an absolute explosion in a way that I haven't seen really with much else in my career, because it's all so new, all so evolving. And as I mentioned, I, I've talked to three new platforms in the last week that are all launching in May, all substantial for the art world. Some are doing more than art, some are doing just art. And, and are they as selling I said, the I NFTs think or are they? They are the NFT platform that's gonna okay. allow the NFTs to be sold, right? So they, they're right. basically the new auction houses, if you will. But I think a month from now, you know, we're, we're in the first inning of this. A month from now, this whole world is going to look so much different because there's so many major players who may have been, you know, working on this for two or three, four months. And since everything, you know, exploded, they're now accelerating that. So, Jen, to your question, it's an amazing question. And it really is at the heart of the IP consideration. From a default standard, the owner of the copyright is the author of the work. So let's say it's a piece of digital art. The copyright will not be transferred to the NFT purchaser of that piece of digital art unless there's an actual transfer that's, that's articulated, signed. I don't think you're gonna find that within the, the, the smart contract, within the Ethereum blockchain because that's the kind of activity that really needs to be discussed and understood. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't gonna be situations where the buyers are gonna have some intellectual property interest. I've been reading about lots of different things. 
things about where there's music involved and people are buying perhaps a 1% interest in the copyright um, along with their NFT purchase. All of those things are possible, right? You can slice and dice IP in a lot of different ways. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. Uh, but, you know, I, I like to think of it at a very rudimentary level. If you're the person buying the NFT artwork, for the most part, you're mm -hmm. buying that digital asset with a right to resell it, but you're not getting the underlying IP rights that go with yeah. it. Those would typically stay with the IP owner seller. And, and would you have the right to display it publicly? Like, could I set up a museum for my NFT and charge people to come see it? Like if I bought another artwork? See, that gets into then what you can do with a work in, under the copyright laws. And the copyrights say that you can do some things, you can't do others. Like you can't make more copies. So if you buy one, you can't make a hundred copies and sell them unless you've been given permission to do that. Got it. And, uh, you know, could you put it in your house and display it? Of course. Could you charge admission to do that? I haven't really thought about that. I don't think so, but I, you know, that's, uh, that's an interesting one. Well, that's interesting. I mean, I think folks are setting up galleries. Now, certainly a gallery is not charging you to, to come in necessarily. They're trying to resell the art for you. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I guess this has been a, a question of mine is just how this fits in and the, in parallels to the, the fine art world. And I think, as you're mentioning, this is such an emerging area. I mean, some of these things we're not gonna have the answers to. I think they're probably, uh, at some point there will be high profile cases litigated on some of these questions, most likely, um, but, but we're, it's- Well, I, I, I can give you, if you don't mind, I can give yeah, you one really please. tangible example in the comic book art world uh, where I believe there were some, you know, cause the comic book artists, their rights go back many, many years, right? And a lot of them still have a lot of the images for what they drew years and years ago. And some of these things were starting to surface on NFT sites. And then Marvel and Warner uh, basically came out and said, you can't do that. That's all, you can't depict our yep. characters. That's all our rights. So, you know, there's so many interesting IP considerations that go along with this. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, Tedar, do you have anything to add on, on that? Sure, I'm happy to add a, a couple of thoughts here. Um, I'll, I'll say ahead of time that I'm gonna defer to Jed on all sort of um, intellectual property related matters. I'm, I'm actually a corporate lawyer, um, and, but I think there's a lot of very interesting commercial and, and tied into sort of the tied into IP considerations that are relating to NFTs. Um, first of all, there's this issue of how artists get compensated. Um, that's very, very deeply embedded in a lot of these, um, uh, these questions regarding monetizing digital assets. Yeah. This, I mean, the, the ability to sort of, when you, when you, um, when you can sell things using a smart contract, you have this ability to sort of retain um, uh, sort of an inherent sort of payment structure to creators yep, yep. for, you know, on a continuing basis, which I think is a wonderful thing for artists um, and is a wonderful way for, for artists to be able to retain um, uh, rights over secondary sales, um, which is a, a huge problem. And I think and one, one thing to note is that um, secondary sales account for traditionally and typically and across a lot of different markets, more value than primary sales. So when Beyonce, for example, is having a concert and she's making most of her money today as, as musicians make most of their money today through ticket sales, um, the value that she's getting from those ticket sales mm -hmm. pales in comparison to the value that the, the secondary sale, the secondary markets are making off those ticket sales. Yeah. So, these so when you look at it in this context, and I think it's interesting to, to, to see what, what Jet's saying in, in um, in, in the context of rights of reproduction, um, this, as you know, it, while it's really unclear what you can do with these NFTs, and I think those are the rules or the sort of the law around those and the contracts around those are going to have to be a little bit more fleshed out. Because I, like Jed, have been, you know, involved in this space, you know, for the last, for me, just the last couple months, um, and um, 
and I can see that it's 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 moving it's moving faster than mm -hmm. sort of the speed of law, I would say. Um, and a lot of the terms and conditions around these NFT platforms which are popping up, and I heard Jed, Jed's involved in those as well, and, and NFT creators, um, and, and how and what rights are involved. And I was actually earlier today just involved on a call also about funding, funding a movie deal using NFTs. And there's, there's a lot, I mean, this concept of, of, of using a, a non-fungible token to, yep. to, um, to generate interest or to try to create some value or to try to create some sort of stakeholder relationship, which is really a big, what, what I see as a, a really big part of, um, of, of the uh, power of, of smart contracts and blockchain technology is creating stakeholder relationships where before people were sort of passively involved in a lot of a lot of ways, either either in terms of voting or in terms of being being able to be the recipient of a future mm -hmm. proceeds, as, as, you know, as the case would be with with artists. Um, I think those 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 things are being fleshed out as we speak right now. And yeah. on the corporate side, it's even more of a mess. Um, and this has been going on for qu quite a number of years right now. We're trying to understand exactly what it means when you go and deliver tokens, issue tokens, transfer tokens to people, what that means and the context and the, the, the underlying value and, and, and whether this, you know, whether this is actually the sale of securities or not and in what cases. Yeah. Definitely the, <laughs> seems the rule is that it is in almost all situations, but there are, there are definitely a couple of situations where it wouldn't be. But I think that with respect to NFTs, one thing that I think is really interesting is that it's a way for artists to create a digital asset. And this is a term that I, I heard just recently, which is a combination of physical and digital. So you have artists that are creating things that are physical, but want to somehow either retain some value going forward or find a way to to create another dimension to their asset. So I apologize if I haven't really spoken to the intellectual property aspects here, no, but I just wanted to flag This is fantastic. Yeah. Actually, I mean, in my mind, okay, you've opened up a few other things that I that I wanna talk about for sure. So, um, and some of those things are, well, let's talk about the technology first. So now we have these technologies. I mean, it, it, we think of the, the category of technologies here as data economic operating systems. So whether it's mm -hmm. an Ethereum blockchain, whether it's, uh, the Lydian data economics operating system that our company is developing, uh, you know, Bitcoin, any kind of these systems that you're using that, that use essentially, you know, these fundamentals of, of distributed databases, distributed ledger technologies, blockchains, at the core, it, as you said, it does enable this really sophisticated kind of downstream tracking um, and, and following of all this data. And then as you track that information in one direction, you can put money or, or value going back in the other uh, direction, whether that's you know, just a contract that translates into dollars or whether it's, you know, something automated through through a cryptocurrency. And I think some of these questions that you brought up around, like, at what point does this become a security? Um, you know, that's fascinating. I, I come from the biotech world. So in the biotech world for a while, we've had these ideas of like royalty-based financing or combined like equity and royalty deals. And one of the issues there was that the royalties were like never that uh, liquid. And they were really difficult to to you know trade off at some point, and you know some other company would have to like do a whole valuation and try to assess that royalty value. And then if you wanted to audit it, you've got to go somehow get the books of I don't know this biotech sales all over the world, and maybe that's through who knows how many thousands of distributors, etc. I mean, I see a lot of potential for this uh, traceability technology in terms of um, tracking and enforcing maybe the not only the intellectual property rights but the contractual rights. I guess you could say to that intellectual property and to the monetization coming from that intellectual property. Um, so, so that that's kind of the thoughts that that I come away with from what you said. And maybe one of my questions would be, um, like, how do, how is that line between like, is this a security? Is this not a security um, track? Like, if you because I don't think traditionally, although I might be wrong, like if I um if I were selling like a royalty, a, a piece of a royalty, is that a security? If you are, so if you are, so there's, there's a test called the Howey test and right. it essentially, it, it essentially breaks down. I'm not going to get into all, all, all the different prongs of the test, but the idea is there's, there's basically three, three options. You could be selling something like a token to, to play a video game where you're getting a right to, to do something mm -hmm. um, like a, that would be like a currency. And another, is that like another the utility option, token model. 
What? Is that like a utility token model where it's defined as utility yes, and not exactly. security? Okay. That would be a utility token. A utility token. And, and another option is really where you are basically purchasing some kind of token, but essentially what you are hoping to do from that token is that the to that, that token will appreciate in value by virtue of the work of others. That's and that's not all of the prongs of the test. But that's, that sounds that's like what, a security, right? I mean, that's that kind of what like you're a, buying yes. when you buy a stock. <laughs> so when you come, when you buy something and you hope that it's going to be that it's going to appreciate in value, and it's not because, you know, you know, it's going to be because there's going to be certain certain things that are going to go on behind the scenes, mm -hmm. and certain, you know, um, I would say uh, certain uh, like a product or some kind of value that be generated, um, then I think that's that's the sort of general rule as, well, as, as, as to whether, whether it would be considered a security. Now, that, that's, there's a big debate around that right now because sometimes it's unclear. Sometimes you can, you can play with sort of the demand for a token. Um, and, and, and a lot of times these token economies are tied to, to products themselves. You have you know, distributed, you, you, you distributed applications that are, that are themselves sort of products. But I mean, and, and, and a lot of times these token, these token ecosystems are tied to product ecosystems also. So folks that are trying to build um, a token economy, maybe some of the same people that are also building a product. And they're kind of hoping right. by selling the tokens that they're gonna be able to help build their product. And the people that buy the tokens are gonna experience an increase in the value per token of, that, of, the, of those tokens yeah. by virtue of the product that's being developed. And, they're, and they're, 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 that is where a lot of the sort of um, a, 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 a lot of the issues arise around that. Um, but one of the things I did want to talk about um, is um, the issue which you mentioned of, of, of liquidity around royalties. And I think this is another really interesting point around um, sort of the, the power of, of using um, digital assets to um, digital assets to sell to sell things of value, which is that they can also be used as a way to create transparency and more information. Absolutely. So you can use the sort of escrowing system that is a smart contract to, um, to incentivize people to provide more information around things. And, and the minute you have sort of this sort of, uh, you, you have sort of a, um, a, a general state of understanding as to what information, uh, information about a certain asset, then it can be sold really quickly. And I think that's really a lot of times where you can see a lot of liquidity, and I mean, I think you see in the, in, in the private market, certainly in the art market, um, and in, in in other markets, you can see that things sometimes struggle to be sold, um, not necessarily because there isn't uh, sufficient demand for for those assets, or there wouldn't otherwise be sufficient demand for those assets, but but because people don't know enough and can't learn enough quickly enough about what those assets are in order to quickly move them. According to, to quickly transfer them. So yeah. this is one of the issues that, I, that I'm very interested in is, 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 is using blockchain to try to create a little bit more liquidity in different markets. And I think one of the, one, one, and I think what we're seeing with NFTs is that people are buying NFTs all because they believe that they're valuable, but also because you can immediately sell them. You can immediately turn, them, turn around and sell them. So I, I, I'd be interested to hear what, what, what you think about that and also what you think about that, Jeff. Sure. I mean, I, I appreciate both of your comments on liquidity and transparency. I am very familiar with the royalty world. Jen, I've had your experience where transparency has been an issue. Um, we've been involved in several areas where we've had to value them for securitization purposes, and that's really tricky. Um, so I do hope that this brings perhaps, you know, being an optimist that this is you know, an opportunity for greater transparency uh, in a way that we haven't seen before. Yeah, and, and you know, I also, the other th thought that I had as you guys were talking about this in terms of transparency, and I know we have talked a bit about NFTs in the art world, and I'm going to pivot a bit to talk more about tech, but just the other thought is that, you know, the, the fine art kind of world has become one of the last uh, places where you can really go to, to launder a lot of money. Um, <laughs> And uh, not that any of us are, are interested in doing that, but we might be interested in helping make sure that doesn't happen. And I think as responsible consumers, we want to make sure that we're buying things that aren't contributing to, um, you know, bad things happening in the world. And sometimes that's hard to know on the on the secondary art market. 
for example, I mean, the other thing is, is, was mentioned is that artists aren't really profiting off these secondary sales uh, whatsoever. So, you know, you could, you could paint something that you had sold for a couple hundred bucks at a gallery when you were starting out and is now going at, at Christie's or Sotheby's for a few million bucks. And you see no upside from that as the original, um, as the original artist. So I, I would be really optimistic about um, the, the potential to apply some of this technology and what we're learning from the NFT market into the broader uh, kind of like arts and creative, um, creative assets like market as well. Uh, historically, I think there's a lot of potential there. So I don't know if, if you guys yeah, have and then, any of that. Yeah, and I can, I can kind of, I agree. Like with both of you who've talked about the kind of problems with artists and how they've been yeah. really underserved and undercompensated. And I've experienced that throughout my career in many different industries. Uh, I also agree that there's, I think really two levels, you know, you see the, the, the fine artists who are really profiting, but I think there's a level below that of people who really aren't, as you said, and certainly with the secondary sales and beyond. Mm -hmm. But just to mention one interesting legal point about that, there's always been a poison pill in the Copyright Act mm -hmm. uh, to protect basically people like artists who may have had to transfer rights of their copyrights at a certain time. And that's called the, the Section 203 termination where anybody who transferred a right by assignment can recapture that right, it's believe it or not, after 35 years. And that was a really big issue back in the 2000s because what happened was artists who had rights uh, dating back uh, basically started to start sending termination notices. And this impacted video games, movies in progress. We actually had a situation involving uh, the Friday the 13th uh, film property where one of the writers took the rights back. These things are very impactful and it'll be interesting to see if there's another wave of these at some point in the future because mm -hmm. the same thing's happening now with these digital rights and but th there's always that future and, and the risk that an artist can try to take something back in terms of a copyright that's been transferred. That's really fascinating. Um, yeah, so I'd like to pivot the conversation a little bit um, to talk now more about uh, the kind of technologies used to, to build these platforms and offer all of these digital assets. So I know having been through uh, the patent process a few times now and, and now working through another one um, where we are trying to patent some of the, the inherent technology pieces involved in um, forming uh, digital assets, essentially. I mean, how do we think about... Uh, there, there's, I, I know our patent laws really are not set up right now to accommodate for these kinds of things. I mean, they're, they're antiquated. I think a lot of us would agree. In my mind, we're increasingly seeing that what these kind of platforms are enabling is taking raw data and essentially productizing it. I mean, this is almost like a manufacturing process. Um, in my mind, it is a manufacturing process. I know that, that in a lot of other sectors, we can patent the manufacturing process to go from raw material to finished um, material, but it seems, you know, USPTO doesn't really see it this way. Is there, are there things that, that inventors can do um, thinking about this, Jed, or, or do we so just- So I, 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 I share your pain. I, yeah. I know what you're talking about. I'm familiar with the patent issues and the challenges. And again, as I said at the very beginning, this is just one area where the market and technology has gotten so far ahead of the law and I don't think it's gonna require a change in law as much as a change in understanding and appreciation of what you said, which is how this data can actually be a process. And then um, for the examiners and for courts to change their interpretation of the law to recognize this, that it actually fits under the current patent scheme as it exists now. Yeah, because I do see that that could be a possibility. I think there, there's this maybe misconception that a lot of these things are just like software that, that is not subject to patentability. Um, and if you actually look at it, I think increasingly we're realizing, at, at least in my mind, from like a theoretical standpoint, that digital data is kind of like something else when it's structured a certain way, it becomes a much more tangible, um, you know, it's possible to serialize when it's combined with these technologies. Um, and to me, then that makes it something something different. And I think that the the software uh, machines, essentially, that, that are, are like serving as manufacturing processes, 
to, right. to create and to encode um, uh, essentially or transform the data to like make make a thing in NFT that before was just a, a digital art scribble on your on your computer. And I would say again, as I said at the beginning, trying to get to the point of the patenting process, it should always be a goal, right? But if that's not possible right now because you're just too far ahead, it shouldn't stop the commercialization process, right? You still have a valuable digital asset that you can package together, claim proprietary technology rights Yep. and find investors, find a market, find clients who will recognize the value of that. And there will be commercial transactions that are result, regardless of the fact that the patent office hasn't given its stamp of approval. Yeah, that's, that's a, a great um, piece of advice for, for people out there that are thinking like, how do I advance the project that I'm working on, you know, right now in that space? And I think they'll appreciate that, that it's not, you know, you can continue advancing commercially, even if you're trying to get a patent or waiting for the patent office to act. Um, on what you have. So um, I don't know, Tedar, do you have any other comments on, on this field? Yeah, I, I, I'd like to say that also that it's that, that um, just as sort of as a side note is that even if the patent office isn't moving as fast as it should, it doesn't mean you shouldn't go forward with a process to try to uh, retain um, you know, any sort of patent rights that you can get in the process. Because if you go forward without it, you're going to be you're going to be losing out. I mean, I think Jed will be able to speak more in depth to this. But even the fact that you may not succeed and in, in, in the field is kind of moving more quickly, and 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 the, and the USPTO and, and the court system aren't really able to understand the sort of data manufacturing and kind of package it together as some sort of software patent that that has a, a stigma attached to it because of for for the for 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 other reasons because because they they think of they think of software as just something that's copying things that you're doing in real life, instead of this being sort of a completely new type of manufacturing. It yeah. still doesn't mean that you shouldn't go forward. And I think Jen, you could probably, you could probably speak more, uh, more you know, better about this, but it still makes sense to go forward with the patent process. You don't want to lose out and say it's not worth the it's not worth the try because then you'll then immediately once you start disclosing and commercializing this, commercializing your technology. Um, um, you'll, you'll be immediately kind of disclosing this to the public and it won't be right. important. Yeah, I mean, that's an important point. And Jed, you know, you can speak much better th to this than I can. What, if, if you have some technology you're thinking of patenting, what steps do you have to take to make sure that you don't, you know, uh, kind of shoot yourself in the foot with being able to apply for a patent on it? Well, I mean, th th first of all, there's a time limitation, right? You have to file the patent within a year of essentially going to market. You always have to be mindful of that, right? You don't want to wait too long. But, you know, there is a certain balancing act, um, too, with are, should you be keeping something a secret and as a trade secret, yeah. which has value? Because remember, once you make the patent disclosure, after 18 months, your application is public and the world now sees it. So, you know, then, you know, th the path to reverse engineer and really copy what you've disclosed is there's a roadmap right there for you know the world to see so that's that's something that um you have to grapple with and i agree i'm a i'm a fan of the patent process and i i'm a believer that you should try but understand the risks that are associated with it mm -hmm. and understand the road that that you and many others have had to endure when you're talking about something that is just so cutting edge uh, at this point and so evolving. Yeah. And, and I think you make a great point also in understanding where the technology that you're trying to protect resides, how deeply, how, how, how easily disclosable and discoverable by a competitor, by somebody that would otherwise use it, that technology is. Because I've seen in, um, a couple of cases where there there have been good reason to think that that you know patented technology, well protected patented technology, is 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 being used and it's almost impossible to discover um, unless you go through a very very uh, costly process um, against you know against 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 
counterparties with with far more resources than you do. Yeah. You so you're saying it's really it's hard mm-hmm. to prove that someone's not or, or that it's hard to prove that someone is using your patented uh, technology yes. because the end result it, might not look the same and and you've got to go go through a lot of probably uh, expensive litigation to even get to that point in discovery. Right. It depends where where what kind if it's technology that's kind of deep in the sort of back back right. end um, um, of a company's product or whether yeah, it's something right. that you can just see in their specs. If you could see something, so, so I think, so these are all kind of important considerations, especially I guess when, when, when you're talking about patenting something where you know, you, the, 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 it's all part of this calculus. So is, right. is, it, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it, am I better off keeping it a secret and making it a trade secret? And, or am I better off trying to um, go through this patent process, knowing knowing well that I, knowing for well that I may not get the patent, and even if I do get the patent, I may not really um, benefit from the protection that that it provides because competitors will be able to utilize it, and I won't be able to really know that they are. Yeah, and it's not just competitors. Remember, it's potential, you know, clients as well. I mean, you know, you've got this great uh, patented methodology, this process. Um, you've disclosed it in your patent, and now you as a developer may be going to pitch this to clients who are now equally able to read the disclosures and potentially uh, you know, learn how to do this in-house or through other developers. So you know, people often think of just the competitor um, infringer types, but it could be very legitimate large companies as well who are your you know, source of business. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. And I think, you know, you've, you've both made the point that when you have something that's not like a consumer product, I mean, again, I, I think of like the biotech example, if you think a company is copying your drug, you just go get a, get a pill of that drug and you run it through your chemical analyzer and see, are they making the same, the same thing as me? I mean, it's more complex than that, but that's the basic gist of it. It's harder when it's something that's kind of like deep in the stack and it's not immediately obvious to folks. So I think that's a consideration that, um, yeah, pro- probably uh, is not as front of mind as it should be for, for inventors or for founders of, um, you know, where are there risks to disclosing a lot of this uh, that I have to think about and, and think about the timing of that as well. That's fascinating. Um, there's, there's one more one more point I want to bring up. And this actually also is a, a question, probably a question for Jed as well as, as, as an IP expert is, is with respect to using copyright protection to protect um, to protect code um, in sort of newer programming languages. So I mean, older programming languages, sometimes there's workarounds where you can, co- you can copyright code and not disclose all the code in the process of filing the copyright, disclose parts of it. But, but in, in newer programming languages um, that are a little bit more simplistic, like you look at, or, or, or a little bit simpler to code in, and, and I don't know that much about Solidity and, and, and some of these newer, newer languages that are used, but, but if there aren't that many ways, different ways to code certain things, and you have, and you have what you think is something a protect, if you if you have basically a way to, you can you can maybe protect your idea better using copyrights, and maybe trade secrets in combination, or maybe you can explain. Then maybe you probably would otherwise with with, with a patent, and also more. Oh, simply, I agree, and and I, and I think that is industry standard, by the way, um, although it's not without risk because it was just a week or two ago in that Supreme Court case where it was the fair use, where they had taken part of the code, used it, but because it was such an infinitesimally small amount, it was considered uh, fair use and not an infringement. So there's always risk there, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so the next question I would ask you guys, I mean, what's been top of mind in either of your practices? Like what are our startups or, or companies in this digital assets space kind of bringing to you is there questions or challenges that we haven't talked about today and again i mean i know you guys won't but don't give us any like uh confidential or specific uh, companies or anything like that but are, are there topics or issues that have come up that um you know any of these companies have identified that we're not thinking about more widely and they're they're really urgent well i mean for me personally again the 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 last few months have been so dominated by nfts that yeah. it really was unexpected and glorious. It was, you know, a a nice surprise. It's really kind of the golden age because it's also evolving. But, you know, look, from, you know, we represent very small founders to very large companies. 
uh, I'm not sure there's really, you know, a lot of differences and nuance. To me, your concerns are typically unique to where you are in the life cycle of your company. You know, the founders have, you know, concerns that are much more corporate than IP typically. Um, whereas the later stage mature companies, they're much more focused on IP valuation, IP sales, other mm -hmm. monetization techniques. And, you know, that world has, has changed a lot in recent years. There's more avenues for that than there ever were before. Um, but, you know, again, for me, just that 2021 has been such an energy for NFTs that uh, I think we're going to see where this goes, <laughs> certainly for the next few months. Um, so I work a lot with, with founders and startups, and I work with, with investors as well. Um, and I think that I'd like to echo what Jed said. I think that a lot of the issues that are important to founders in the beginning are structural issues or corporate structural issues. Mm -hmm. Those are really understanding, you know, and, 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 it, depending where, depending on how um, uh, the idea for a business um, is formed, um, sometimes the IP kind of takes precedence in the beginning, especially if it's sort of like a university spinoff and sort right. of the IP is already more mature than, um, than, than I would say maybe the, the is, 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 is more mature than let's say than it otherwise would be if this was just kind of a startup idea and they're trying to build the product and the IP at the same time. The IP is already kind of a little bit more robust then some, a lot of the IP, IP issues are also very heavily um, uh, at top, in the top of mind of, of founders in the beginning. But a lot of times it's understanding the setup and understanding how to deploy a product. And when it comes to um, uh, digital asset companies, um, another big issue is understanding where, what, whether the, the, the sort of the token economy comes first or whether the company comes first, and like a lot of issues around that and understanding mm, yeah. because this, this, this sort of additional dimension that's, that's added through, um, you know, in these types of businesses it, it are, are, you know, a lot of the, the big considerations that, that, that companies have. Yeah. I mean, there are a ton of, of complexities. Actually, I think on Friday we have a, a panel on embedded finance and just talking about how so many companies that, that used to be completely detached from finance and fintech or incorporating these fintech products directly into what they're doing, which uh, is cool and it might raise your valuation and have a lot of upside for you, but it adds an, an incredible amount of complexity. And I mean, I've even seen that in some examples of, of startups that they have to spend more time on the whole token management thing and you know managing all these users and telegram groups and communities and whatever else you have to do to kind of sustain your, your token price and, and all of that. It, I mean, it doesn't always give them all the time to focus on product that they need. So it's definitely a, a challenge. Um, it's, it's a yeah. big challenge. Yeah. yeah and, and good point about product also, I think, is that a lot of, in, especially now in 2021, there are companies, I, I see a lot of companies are, are looking to find ways to monetize uh, their story and their cap table and, and, and what they have, um, you know, faster than they're growing their product because um, and, you can't, and you can't fault them at all for this because of the, you know, the incredible array of opportunities that they have available to them, especially if they're in the digital asset space, but even otherwise. So you have companies that are really otherwise early stage companies that are already looking at some of these, you know, uh, opportunities to go onto these capital market opportunities um, and uh, licensing opportunities, exit opportunities um, very, very quickly because there's such, you know, there, I think not necessarily, not just because there's a lot of interest right now in, 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 in technology markets, but also because um, very quickly the, the menu of options in to capitalize and uh, to capitalize companies has just increased. So it's it, it, what, what, what otherwise, when there was otherwise only a couple of different paths, now it seems like the number of paths has, has doubled. Yeah, no, no, I mean, that's, Fantastic point. I mean, man, I'm, I'm enjoying this conversation so much, guys. I'm just looking at time and I want to make sure that the audience knows if they have questions uh, to, to please ping them into the Q&A. Because um, if not, I could just keep monopolizing uh, the great NLX I have in front of me all day. <laughs> I think Jed knows that I have a little bit of like a FOMO over not having gone to law school. Um, 
you know, I dropped out of pre-law in the class where they said for this whole week, you have to keep track of your time in six minute increments. And I seriously, I walked, I, I turned in my drop class form that afternoon because I was like, this is too much admin. <laughs> for that was admin the best admin. decision you ever made. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but this is so much fun. I mean, I, I'm, I'm learning a ton listening to you both. So, so please let's go uh, audience, any questions? Um, any questions for us? I'm sure there, there's gotta be some. I don't know, hearing uh, no one jumping to the floor, but we'll give them we'll give them a minute. And yeah, you know, I mean, it's fascinating to me as I think about, as you said, the, so many more paths exist now for these early stage companies to, to mm -hmm. monetize. I mean, I've definitely been wondering like, is this NFT craze just the next, but maybe more sophisticated wave of the ICO craze that we saw or the altcoin craze that we saw? And I, I guess just my thought is I've, I'm, encouraged to see that every kind of wave and stage of this is done with more uh, sophistication, more parameters in place. I think a much better understanding of, of like, you know, companies knowing if they're issuing a security or not, knowing what the rules are. So the, the regulatory space in this is shaping up really, really quickly. I think, you know, as you said, IP where, where maybe there are some areas that remain a little bit gray areas, but for the most part, it seems that there are some pretty strong paradigms out there for how all of this could work. I mean, are there are there missing um, gaps to fill? And then we do have I mean, one look, question. In, in terms of IP, the system's going to hold, right? I mean, the, the copyright system we have, it's going to work. We're going to sort out all the different complexities because there are so many different applications and ways that the NFT process could work. But, um, you know, eventually the rights holders will be able to assert their rights and, and the system will hold. So I, I'm not worried about that. But Clearly, there could be a refresh. Um, I'm sure, just like there needs to be on the finance side with securities, sure. uh, to kind of adapt to how fast things are moving. All right, and then one closing question, and, and we'll wrap up after that. Uh, one of the audience members writes: What are some of the resources that founders can use to learn more about the laws around digital assets? How can founders be careful to not put themselves and their businesses at risk? As we've seen with some of the fallout from the ICO and utility token sale craze a few years ago, see example Ripple. Yeah, so in terms of education and resources, you know, it's something I should have mentioned about the founding stage is making sure, uh, number one, that you're, you're acquiring the rights you need for the technology and you're doing it in a proper way. Sure. And number two is, you know, doing some modicum of freedom to operate consideration to make sure that whatever you're moving forward with is not gonna infringe what, the rights of others. That's a pretty key consideration for an early stage company. Um, in terms of specific resources, there's lots of great sites. I'm happy to, after this, uh, refer some, um, you know, I'll send links around that maybe we can share with the audience. Oh yeah, we could add them on the page. That yep. would be fantastic. Sure. I know, Tedar, do you have any other thoughts, you know, for the founder that can't necessarily like afford to come plop down a whole uh, retainer at Pearl Cohen early on? <laughs> uh, well, what, what can they do to educate themselves before they come in and have those conversations with attorneys to really get to their, get to their key questions? Oh, you're on, you're mute, my friend. <laughs> Um, I think it really depends on what you're trying to do. I would say that if you're looking to um, issue tokens or say, then I think that there's going to be little, I, I think that you're probably going to need to find, um, you're going to find some legal help because it is a little precarious generally, yeah. but for, but if you are, but if what you're not, if what you're trying to do is not sort of, um, um, if, if digital assets are um, a product of yours and really what you're in, in but you still are sort of more traditionally structured company. Mm -hmm. And I think there's an incredible amount of resources for founders out there um, on, on, on formation. And then I think that there's a lot of resources also on ways that you can protect your assets. Um, there's also a lot of resources out there and I'm happy to share some resources for, for, for founders and for um, about startups and, 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 you know, and, and things of that nature. And, and as far as sort of digital assets are concerned um, as well, but um, yeah, I mean, if you're looking to issue tokens or, or trying to monetize, uh, monetize that way or create a, a currency or something like that, I think that, yeah, you, you might need a- Yeah, don't do this at home, kids. You need to 
to have some adult supervision, I think is what you're, what you're saying. And, and I think that's true. I mean, we've seen, we've seen the fallout from some of these companies that made missteps. And uh, I don't think this is something that you'd wanna do without some good legal advice. So I appreciate that. Sorry, and I have one more last minute question um, on the NFTs, and this is to Jed. A lot of large companies are scrambling to put together an NFT strategy. What would you advise these companies to do as they research opportunities and risk? So these are the discussions I'm having every day from clients. And you know, the first consideration is do an audit of what assets you have, figure out you know, what it is that's potentially um, viable. And then step two is figure out, and this could be the help of advisors, lawyers, whatever, what platform is suitable because we're going, we've already, I think, gone through a, a 1.0 to 2.0. You saw the beginning that happened. And, you know, when you go on a site like OpenSea, you get overwhelmed by just too many images, honestly, just too much crap that's there. And I think once we get through this stage, um, I'm the companies we've been talking to, the new platforms, they're much more targeted, they're much more curated. You know, if, if you're talking about large companies with real mm -hmm. assets, you'll be able to find a platform partner that will focus on you. Uh, and look, some of the bigger companies are, are, gonna, are creating their own, you know, like the NBA did with Top Shot. Uh, I mean, it really depends who you are and, and yeah. what your resources and wherewithal are. Yeah, I think that's that's fantastic. Fantastic commentary. So, you know, watch this space a lot more to evolve in, in coming weeks and coming months. Um, as as some of these uh, additional big companies jump into to the space. And I think as you're saying, there are gonna be some more players emerging that we may not have heard of yet. And, and maybe by the end of the year, will be more household names in, in digital assets. So that's fantastic to hear. Um, hey, we're, we're at time. So thank you gentlemen so much. This has been fantastic. I'm getting some comments on how happy people are to hear uh, this panel. And, and I know it's it's often not often the opportunity you get to sit down and have kind of just unfettered uh, conversation with a couple of really great lawyers who who know the space so well and are really experts. So, you know, I appreciate it. The audience appreciates it and uh, hope there's there's more to come and chat about in this space soon. Thank you so much. Well. Good luck great with the rest you. of the week. Thanks, you too. <laughs> Bye. Thanks.